Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on April 18th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. I seem to be saying this every Tuesday, but a lot has happened in Florida in the last week, and perhaps the biggest news happened on Thursday when the Florida House passed, and then the governor quietly signed a law that outlaws most abortions in Florida after six weeks of gestation. Well, that's before most pregnant people even know they're carrying an embryo. So let's first, before we bring in our guests, let's listen to a story that was written and produced by WMNF reporter Chris Young. Also, I want to say maybe as soon as possible during the show that I'd like to hear from you, If especially if you're a woman that's weighing in on this issue, you can drop me a line at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. So here's Chris Young's story that he filed before the law was signed into law by Governor Ron DeSantis. He uh, it came after the most restrictive abortion bill in recent state history was passed by the Florida House. House today as representatives debated the abortion ban. This new ban is beyond radical, it's extreme. There are people in this state right now who don't even know they are pregnant. They don't know right now at this very minute while I stand here before you that there is a complication. This is a death sentence for them. That was Democratic Representative Rita Harris. The bill would restrict abortions past six weeks with exemptions for rape or incest with documentation. One of the bill's sponsors, Republican Representative Jenna Persons Malika, faced questioning regarding terminology in the bill. Are you aware that the phrase termination of human life is based on a religious belief? This bill is not based on any religious beliefs, and the bill refers to the termination of human pregnancies. I do believe, and it's not because of my religion, that that is a human life. Despite the bill's sponsors claiming it's not based on religious beliefs, Many Republican senators cited religion as their reason for support, including Representative Kayanne Michael. And as long as this is the United States of America, there is only one. We could choose whatever God, people could have that right. But we were founded as a nation on one God. And I thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you for having the courage. I stand with you. I proudly stand with you. And I say that all lives matter, including those babies in the womb that we should protect. Democrats critiqued what they call a lack of choice for women. For Representative Robin Bartleman, the issue hits home. As I started this debate, I shared my story once again. And let me tell you, I had legal pads all over my damn house. What if I keep the baby? What if I don't keep the baby? How am I going to afford it? What am I going to do? What happens to Emma? Is she taking care of this? This? If, what, what? I was a special ed teacher. Can you imagine how difficult that was for me to make? I've dedicated my life to special needs kids and I have a fetal fatal abnormality, it is this simple. No one belongs in that room but me, my husband, my God, and my doctor. The bill passed 70 to 40. For WMNF News, I'm Chris Young. Well, thank you to WMNF's Chris Young for that story. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on April 18th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. I do want to hear from you on this issue. Do you have a story that you'd like to share with our audience? I'd especially like to hear from women who weigh in on this issue. You can drop me a line at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. Sign your name if you're comfortable doing so. And I'm going to give priority to women who call in as well. The number is 813-239-9663. Let's bring in our guests now to talk about what this new law is and what it means for Floridians. Amy Weintraub is Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Amy. Oh, thank you, Sean, for having me back. It's always a privilege to be on WMNF and to talk with the community about what's going on in the world of reproductive freedom. I'm so glad you could come on. It's a very important issue that we're talking about today. We're, we're not done talking about it. I'm sure we'll be talking about this for months to come in Florida And before we get too much further, I should point out that Amy is also a member of WMNF's Community Advisory Board and Programming Committee. So thank you for your your volunteering in the community on that regard, Amy. But what are your initial reactions about this law, what it means for Floridians and other people uh, for and for anyone who might become pregnant in Florida? You know, these these are really, really scary times. And for those of us on the ground, you know, in some, in many ways, we saw it coming. We've 
we've been uh, sort of feeling like the boy who cried wolf for many years, like, you know, saying it, it as we watch the legislature, the makeup of the legislature shift to uh, radical right folks being in there and them getting more and more seats to now having super majorities. It is, um, it, we, we sort of knew it was coming, but still yet, still yet um, to see this onerous restrictions being imposed on Floridians, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And we know that it is the people who have the fewest resources who are going to be impacted. And that it, that makes it very, very, for those of us who care about humanity and who care about things like economic justice and fairness, it makes it so stressful. This law won't take effect immediately as it's written. First up, it has there has to be a resolution of a restrictive 15-week abortion ban that was signed last year by Governor Ron DeSantis. Can you remind people where that stands? Absolutely. So the effective date of this six-week ban is tied to the Florida Supreme Court's decision or ruling on the constitutional right to privacy. Um, there has been so much precedent over decades of precedent that that the const that written into our state constitution is that we have the right to private um, private decisions, and the Supreme Court has ruled over and over that that includes private medical decisions, and including abortion. So um, the 15 week ban, which passed last year was immediately, um, uh, there were lawsuits filed by Planned Parenthood, by a woman's choice, which is an independent provider, Bread and Roses in Gainesville, a bunch of independents, and the ACLU filed a lawsuit saying that the 15-week ban is in opposition to our right to privacy. And so that is now being decided by our state Supreme Court. Because the, the court is full of DeSantis appointees, and who are who are very likely to have a much more pinched view of what the privacy clause really stands for. We fear that they will take out the the protections surrounding abortion decisions, and um, and that they will rule that the fifteen week ban will stand. If that happens, then the six week ban would also stand, and there would be a thirty day window between the time that the the court rules and that six-week ban goes into effect. If the state Supreme Court holds upholds the 15-week ban or turns it down, is, it, is there a chance that that case could go to the U.S. Supreme Court? Um, yes, there is There is that chance that, um, that it would go to the, the U.S. Supreme Court, but it is likely that until the Supreme Court heard that decision, the the ban would be in effect. The new six week ban. Correct. So um, before I go too much further, I want to tell people we have a full phone bank right now because people are really excited to talk about this. So be patient a little bit longer. Normally I get to calls way later in the show, but I probably will get to the calls very quickly because um, you know I it can I can tell that a lot of people want to talk about this. But just be patient a little bit longer. I'm going to ask Amy a question or two more, and then we'll get to your phone calls. So, Amy, um, one thing I would like to ask is this six-week limit. How is it counted? For example, I read a question online um, that was asked, how can I be considered four weeks pregnant if I conceived two weeks ago? Does this, a law, does this law address how it's counted, how many weeks of pregnancy, how, how many weeks pregnant someone is? There is, I have heard a lot of discussion about that, even among providers and among, you know, advocates and people who are concerned, just like the person who, who you're describing. And I do not believe that the law has strict clarity on that. Um, and so at this point, I think that those are some of the things that really, really need to be ironed out. I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive answer. Well, you know, it's uh, the fact that you don't have a definitive answer might be an answer in itself because it it, it does seem very confusing because a, a lot of the things I read said that a person's pregnancy is counted from the day of their last period. The, the, menstrual the first period. day of their last period. Yes. The yeah, first day and, of their last period. Which, um, you know, from a biological standpoint, it's very unlikely that per a person would get pregnant then. It would probably be 
more than a week later. So you could be, it could be just six weeks. For, if the law is interpreted to mean that it's six weeks from then, it might only be four weeks after you've actually gotten pregnant that you can't, um, you know, that you that you can't have an abortion in Florida. But the point maybe is that it's so unclear that it there it leaves a lot of question for these people who are demand, you know, who are uh, really desperate need of a, a quick attention. It seems if this law does go into effect, and that also brings up the case: How does the government know? Do that is there? Are they going to be keeping tabs on when people have sex or when people's periods are? I'm I don't know. Maybe I'll turn this over to you now that I've set up all these uh, kind of question marks. And really the the responsibility or the liability rests with the drop with the doctors because they're the ones who are being targeted as criminals by this bill if they provide care that exceeds the six week the, the six week period whatever that is and so the doctors are the ones who are at risk of being becoming imprisoned and um you know all of the all of this shame and stigma that goes with the prosecution so they're the ones who are going to be especially, you know, needing to have these answers and figure that out. And I, I'm guessing that they're going to err on the side of caution, many of them, because they don't want to face criminal charges. And so um, it will be interesting to see how the providers um, answer these questions publicly and, and with patients to make sure that people are, you know, are getting the care that they need, but within the limits of the law. Um, so yeah, um, it is a huge, a huge conundrum that, that care providers are facing. Our guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. We're broadcasting live on April 18th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and we're going to go now live to the phone lines uh, to answer, to, to get some questions from our audience and as I mentioned earlier, I especially want to hear from women who are weighing in on this issue. Uh, men, if you're calling or emailing, uh, have some. Have, you might have to have extra patience today. I think that uh, that's fair of me to ask. So I will give priority to women who are calling in. The number is 813-239-9663. You can email dj at wmnf.org or text 813 0885. Let's first hear from Heidi in St. Petersburg. Hello, Heidi, you're on the air. Hello. Go ahead, please. Yeah, the messages that are coming out in the news and on social media, especially, are super confusing. Um, you know, we hear abortions banned and red states are restricting access, that the courts have ruled against abortion pills. And what I want to ask is what's the actual reality in Florida right now? Can people who need abortion get them in this state? All right. Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, please uh, hold on for the response. But um, what is the reality right now? People can still get abortions up to 15 weeks right now. Is that right, Amy? It, it sure is. That is absolutely correct. And there, I have seen people who um, I've heard my friends who are providers say people are calling and saying, you know, is it still possible at all to get one here? And they're confused about if the six week ban is already in place, et cetera. But, but that is, it's a good question because we need to clarify that abortion is available in Florida up to 15 weeks from providers. And we have providers all over the state who are open for business and who are here to serve. And so please, if anyone is in need of care, feel very comfortable that that calling a provider and making an appointment is a legal and safe thing to do. And it is, is absolutely available to anyone up to 15 weeks of pregnancy. Beyond that, by the way, you know, our providers have done an amazing job of setting up unprecedented levels of, of connections with, with, with folks and providers in other states. So they're working every day to get people the care they need, even out, uh, above 15 weeks. Sometimes, I mean, that is going to mean traveling to another state, but they are making that happen. And that's thanks to our amazing abortion providers in the state, as well as abortion funds. Heidi, did that answer your questions? It did. It helped clarify. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for calling in. I appreciate that call. And I just want to remind people that our guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. 
Uh, and um, our last caller, Heidi, mentioned abortion pills. We're going to get to all that in a bit as well. But uh, let me continue with Florida's new new law and the law that's being considered from previous that's being considered in the state Supreme Court. Until the uh, the legality of that 15 week limit is decided by the U by the state Supreme Court, it's the law of the state, but it does not include exceptions for rape or incest. So why do you think that that component is important, Amy? Well, it is important that, that any exceptions are um, are added. Um, and, and you say, why is it is the question, why is it important that those kinds of exceptions be added? Sean, I just want to make sure. I got it. I, yeah, I just maybe okay. am trying to to um, emphasize the fact that the 15 week ban does not have those exceptions. Okay. And maybe you can tell us more about that. Sure. It is the case that people who experience these terrible um, experiences of rape or incest often uh, don't realize they're pregnant till later, and there is extra there are extra levels of shame and stigma involved, and so they are very very likely to delay care, to find out that they're pregnant, to get the money together that they need to seek an um, abortion care. And so it is it is the case that the people that this impacts do not find do not have the wherewithal to get to the care till post 15 weeks. And it is it is an onerous extra punishment of them that they cannot get that care locally. And so um, that 15 week ban with no exceptions for rape and incest is is extremely draconian. And, and it is, you know, a, across the, the nation. A 15-week ban without exceptions is pretty unusual, so it is a real problem. I want to play a bit more of the accounts on the House floor last Thursday, just a couple minutes more. This happened right before the, the law passed. In Chris Young's report earlier, we heard from South Florida Democratic Representative Robin, Robin Bartleman. She was talking about how she struggled with what to do when she was pregnant and her fetus had a fatal fetal abnormality. And she also talked very emotionally about how this law limits the options for, for Floridians in cases like that. So uh, before we go too much further, I want to play a couple more minutes of Robin Bartleman's emotional testimony and remind people that they can call in at 813-239-9663. Right now, I have three men hanging on the line. I certainly want to be able to offer these open phone lines to any women who want to share their experiences at 813-239-9663. You can always email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433. Sorry, 813-433-0885. So here is Florida State Representative Robin Bartleman from South Florida talking about uh, her uh, emotional experience and, and questions about this bill, this new law. This bill upsets me on so, so many levels. So many levels. First of all, do any of you really know you're pregnant at six weeks? I don't even know I miss a period at six weeks. Hell, I'm perimenopausal, I would have no idea. So that doesn't work. Second, the provision for rape and incest, we do a lot of good work in this chamber for sexual assault victims and survivors. We have all spoken with them and we have all met with them and we pass bills to help them. And we know that only two in 10 of them ever report a crime, ever get paperwork, ever. I had a simple amendment a sworn statement so they could, they could do what they needed to do. You know what? That wasn't good enough. We're going to leave it up to the doctors, the doctors who are not lawyers to determine what paperwork is valid and a sworn affidavit isn't good enough. You're going to re-traumatize those victims. The girlfriend who is getting beat up and raped by her boyfriend or the woman or young teenager who is getting raped by her father. Think about that, or family, friends. You're re-traumatizing them. Make it easy for them. A sworn statement. We know they're not going to the police. And third, and this kills me because this could have been me. I could have been any one of these women. Four women, four brave women shared their stories. If this bill really worked, these stories wouldn't be on record. 
That's Democratic State Representative Robin Bartleman speaking Thursday before the House passed Florida's new six-week abortion ban. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. My guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida, and we're broadcasting live on April 18th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So she talked there, Representative Bartleman talked about the exceptions for rape and incest, but the state demanding proof of that and not just a sworn testimony. I think that was one of the amendments that that the Democrats brought up, that it could be a sworn statement, but that was rejected by the full body, which is majority Republican. Um, now they need something like a restraining order or a police report, Amy? Yeah, uh- I was I've been I was up in Tallahassee for two weeks um, prior to this the week the bill passed and the atmosphere there is is so toxic to those of us who are trying to um, trying who are on the side of you know of justice and and of truth and um, I that Bartleman was saying about that all of these people had come and given their their lived stories, their, you know, their, the, the true stories of their lives. And yet the legislators, the majority of them remained, remained unmoved and, and wouldn't even, wouldn't even entertain an amendment that would not, you know, require a victim of rape to, or, you know, um, sexual assault to, to go to, um, the police or get a, go to the courts for a restraining order before being allowed to access abortion care. I mean, it just shows the level of, of uncaring attitudes and misogyny that is prevalent there. And I, um, it, it is very, very shocking. And so, but on the other hand, Sean, I mean, we can talk about exceptions all day long and the need for them and all of that, but in the end, there are so many reasons that people need abortions and it is of course there we have lots of feelings and lots of empathy for people who have experienced the trauma of sexual assault but also people need abortions for a lot of other reasons beyond that and any any um move to deny them the care that they need especially early in pregnancy is so cruel and i um you know, I, I I just want to lift that up, that there are many, many people who are listening right now who have had abortions for reasons of um, that this was the thing that 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 made sense in their life. And um, and they need to be able to access that care also. Let's go now to the phone lines. We'll go back to the phones and talk to Lori in Treasure Island. Hi, Lori, you're on the air. What would you like to ask? Hi, um, this is Lori. And I am infuriated by the abortion ban law that has been passed. And I guess my question is, what can we as individuals do to make a difference, to make sure that people get the care that they need? And also, how do we influence politicians to stop this madness? Thanks for the questions, Lori. Amy? Well, getting people to the care they need is is a big deal. And as um, if these restrictions are allowed to become law, um, we're going to have to raise a lot of money <laughs> to get people um, to on the airplanes that they need to get on, um, to cover their hotel stays in, in points in the North. And so donating to a local abortion fl- fund, including here in Tampa Bay, the Tampa Bay Abortion Fund, is something that I ask, I plead with listeners to consider to make the Tampa Bay Abortion Fund um, a, a philanthropic priority for this year would be such a boon for all of the people who are going to need that, that level of help. And um, making our voices heard is, is super, super important. There will be in the coming weeks many opportunities to let the politicians in Tallahassee know how unhappy we are by the we are by this decision. There will be rallies. There will be other political movements happening. And I I plead with you all to stay alert to those and to participate however you can. There's a role for everyone to play. If you're not someone who wants to take to the streets, no problem. There are other things we can do. But we, it's on us, the electorate, the voters, to make a change ultimately in who is sitting in those seats in the legislature. 
And we have to become more engaged as, as progressive minded, minded people, as people who care about reproductive freedom, we have to become engaged. And even if we're regular, you know, we, we're, we're uh, diehard voters and we never miss an election, we've got to do a better job of talking to our friends and families about why they need to vote too. We have an abysmal um, voting rate here, voter rate here in, in Florida. We've got to turn out more people. And so talking about it, making it, making abortion something that is a, a not stigmatized, but something that we talk about, just like we talk about other political issues is really, really important. So we have to change the makeup of the legislature. And that's, we've got to have a, a long, a long game on that. But we also really, really have to pay close attention to the 2024 um, election. In which Ron DeSantis might be one of the candidates for the Republican nomination. That's right. Oh, and Sean, if I may, I just want to also mention that for anyone who's not sure, like, well, how do I get plugged into activities that are happening? Um, some groups that I would just like to throw out there um, here locally are the League of Women Voters in both, you know, in their many chapters across Tampa Bay, the National Organization for Women. And then here in Pinellas County, we have the Women's Advocacy Movement of uh, Pinellas, WAMP. So some really, really great ways. And of course, like the local Planned Parenthood um, or Planned Parenthood clinics have leadership action teams and university campuses have generation action Planned Parenthood chapters. So there are ways to get involved. And I ask you to consider, consider um, joining up. Well, thank you for that call, Lori. Thank you. I appreciate you calling in and there you can still call in at 813-239-9663. I want to remind people that my guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. This is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And an earlier caller that was Heidi was asking about abortion pills. What can you tell us, Amy, about non-surgical abortions? So what percentage of abortions are non-surgical and what is the update on the availability and the legality of medication abortion? Um, so abortion pills have been legal and, and, and FDA approved in the United States for, for more than 20 years, and they are very, very safe. They're safer than Viagra, safer than penicillin, even safer than Tylenol. And they, um, they are used, people often, I mean, people are presented with the choice of either having um, early in pregnancy, up to 10 weeks, having, uh, when they uh, approach a Florida provider, they can have surgical abortion or they can have use the abortion pills. And more than half of patients now are choosing the abortion pills. There are a lot of reasons for that. It might be because they, they prefer the sort of privacy of having the abortion at home, which the pills um, do, or perhaps they like to be more in control of what's happening with their body. And so they might choose that. Um, so anyway, the abortion pills right now have been targeted by anti-abortion um, organizations. And they have actually, uh, they filed suit in, uh, intentionally in a very conservative district in, in Texas. And the, the judge there, whose name is Matthew Kaczmarek, he ruled in their favor and said that Miffy Pristone, which is one of the, it's, it, that's also known as RU486, and it is the first drug in a two drug regimen to, um, to cause abortion. And he ruled that, that the FDA was in error and that they should not have, a, have approved Miffy Pristone for use at all. And of course, this is absurd because he is not a doctor, he's not a medical researcher, he's not involved with the FDA, and um, he had, actually there's questions about whether he even has the authority to, um, to, to rule on a federal agency who is actually beholden to Congress as, as, their, as their ultimate decision maker. So anyway, he ruled that, and at the same time, actually I understand it was like 45 minutes later, Another judge in Washington state actually um, had taken up a case that was um, that 17 states plus Washington, D.C. asked him, to, and his name's Thomas Rice, Rice, to protect the legality of Miffy Pristone in their states, and he ruled in their favor. So there's sort of these two dueling federal cases. 
And now the Supreme Court is involved and they're going to be um, they're going to be deciding probably this week, maybe as early as tomorrow night, if the um, if the Texas case, the the Kazmarek case is is constitutional or not. And that is they're going to be deciding if, in fact, Miffy Pristone can remain available or not. So that's sort of where we are. And right now they did freeze the decision until until Wednesday. So Miffy Pristone is still being used, is still available at, at, at any abortion providers um, across the nation, but that, that could change. And those drugs are often available by mail. The new Florida law says they could only be dispensed in person or by a physician. What, how that, does that yeah. make a difference? In Florida, it really doesn't make a difference because there is no possibility of a, a Florida doctor or any doctor, any American doctor shipping drugs to a Florida address. So it really, the, the mail order thing doesn't really uh, change things here in Florida because it's never been a possibility. That's not to say that people don't get abortion drugs, Floridians don't get abortion drugs through the mail because they do, but it's from international medical practices and international pharmacies that they do that not from Florida doctors or other American doctors. Well, let's go back to the phone lines. We have Krista, who's been waiting in St. Pete. Hi, Krista, you're on the air. Hi, John and Amy. Thank you so much for having such a powerful conversation this morning. Thank Absolutely. you for being part of it. Uh, I've been a part of it since I was born. I'm a female in this country. And when I was born, Roe v. Wade I, I'm in my 40s, was law. And now, this last summer, I wept for probably a week straight <laughs> for our country, for myself, my daughter. Um, I, I am just so flabbergasted <laughs> at where our government is taking this issue that as you've stated time and time again, is a non-issue. It's a medical, personal, private issue. Regardless of horrible exceptions, there's the everyday person who there's medical complications that have to be addressed. Um, that is, again, like you said, only between the patient, their partner, and their doctor. These conversations that have become so political you just are sad and wonder where they're going to go next um because you think you're almost at the end of the road you're like this could where further could they go but um i'm afraid <laughs> so thank you again for having this amazing conversation and getting this community you know speaking and involved um voting because it's so important the most important thing that we, the duty that we have as citizens. So thank you for taking my call. <laughs> Krista, thanks so much for calling. I appreciate your, your words and thanks for listening. I listen every day. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, Krista. So a Amy, anything you'd like to add to what Krista is saying? All of those things resonate so strongly with me. And um, I, I also reflect on the fact that for all, honestly, for generations, people have enjoyed rights that my daughter no longer has. And I, uh, I just, I am flabbergasted by it, but I try not to, I try to plunge myself back into activity so that I don't just, you know, wallow in despair. And there is so much work to do. And there's going, you know, there are going to be calls to action coming in the next few months. And we're going to need people like Krista to rise. And I know that she will, because I can hear it in her voice. And, um, you know, this will be uh, an unprecedented level of activism that we're going to need as voters and as, as people who care, we are going to have to engage. So let this be a serious wake up call. And one of the political wake up calls you would think uh, that some of the Republicans might have been seeing is in, since that decision that overturned Roe versus Wade last summer, there have been time after time voters have gone to the polls and rejected str uh, 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 stricter abortion limits. Or uh, why don't you give us examples of what's happened at the polls since last summer that might indicate 
that the American people really are not on board with having their their rights taken away like this. Absolutely. There have been ballot initiatives put on um, put put before voters in many states and time and time again, voters have chosen to codify abortion rights in their states. And that is not just in blue states. I'm talking a bit about states like Kentucky. And we have seen court, we've seen um, judicial races impacted by abortion just recently. Was it Wisconsin, Sean? I'm blanking out suddenly, but there was the a Supreme really- Court. Yeah, um, yes, the state Supreme Court where the, the um, person elected unexpectedly was the person who upholds reproductive rights. So anyway, and, and it was a landslide. So we've seen that um, when the vo- when the decision is left to the voters time and time again, they say, yes, abortion rights must be codified. It must be the law of the land or the law of their state. So that, you know, I don't want to get too into too much speculation, but that might might be one of the explanations for why after the bill passed, Governor DeSantis signed it into law instead of it, one of these big public uh, signings. It was done that night kind of uh, in, a, in a, almost a private ceremony where that was signed. And so that makes me wonder, were there any Republicans in the Florida legislature who voted against this bill? Perhaps they could see the writing on the wall or they ha- they heard from their constituents or whatever their reason was. W- were there Republicans who, who voted against this law that you know? There were, and there were voters, there were Republicans who walked out and didn't didn't lodge a vote at all, which is basically a no vote. And so that was, you know, we're very grateful for that. that. Um, they know that this is bad public policy. Either they know it's bad public health policy or they 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 know that politically it's a bad move for them to go on the record, you know, with being in favor of such an extreme ban, a near total abortion ban. Yeah, that was very interesting to watch. Our guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. This is we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We have Bobby on the line in Sarasota. Hi, Bobby. What would you like to say? Well, um, very interesting, timely show, and I appreciate all you all do to get the word out. My problem is, and I I know legislatures don't legislate themselves. They don't make laws to get themselves. But politicians, legislators, judges are making decisions on health care, and they're not qualified. And they should be held accountable for the consequences, particularly, let's say, a woman in her fourth or fifth term who has to go home and have an abortion on her own and find her baby in water when she sits down, and then she's bleeding to death. They should be accountable for the results of their legislation when they meddle in health care and they're not trained for it. And I don't know how to bring that about, but it started with, with pain management in, in Florida with Pam Blondie. And look how that escalated. She, she didn't stop any drug use at all. These are medical problems for medical people to decide on together with the patient and their loved ones. How do we keep them out of our doctor's offices? Thanks for the question, Bobby. We'll put that to Amy. Bobby, I'll tell you, I was in Tallahassee and her doctor after doctor, representatives from the American Medical Association, from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, tell the legislators that what they were proposing would be t- terrible. It would lead to bad health outcomes. It would lead to maternal um, fatalities. It would lead to, to death and et cetera. And those legislators, they did, they just didn't care. They didn't listen. And the, I don't think these particular people, the majority of them even really care about what is good public health. I think all they care about is using using reproductive rights as a pawn in their political games. And the only way to hold them accountable is to get them out of office. Because as long as they're there, they're going to continue with this strategy 
of, um, you know, of, of a very, very right-wing dogmatic power play. And so I think our, the, what you're talking about, terrible, you, you talked about a potential, you know, a, an awful situation with someone later in pregnancy, um, self-managing at home in ways that were very harmful for, for her. And those kinds of stories are going, may become more common and we're going to have to make sure they're told so that people will wake up and will vote correctly going forward got to have a better accountability than just voting. It, so, it's not working. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you know, we used to be able to put an amendment in our Florida Constitution, you know, with a majority of people signing a petition for it. But, you know, of course, they're going to stop that. You know, I mean, I'm angry about a lot of things. I was a registered, I am a registered nurse for 52 years, and we don't have any health education in our school. So the people, our people don't learn about health in their youth so they can carry it forth in their lives. I've met women who don't know where their urine comes out. Honestly, I, I don't want to get gross, but I've seen everything. And uh, thank you for your support and your help on this issue. And I'm right behind you. Bobby, thank you for that call. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, anything you'd like to add, Amy? Oh, I, I'm totally with Bobby on the lack of sex ed. I, I am just amazed that we are, that the legislature and the Department of Education are making moves to make it harder for our young people to have the tools that they need to live safe and uh, safe lives and and make healthy relationship decisions. I am appalled. It's and unbelievable. Not, not to get too far afield from the immediate discussion that we're on, but you know, a lot of the the other some of the other bills in Tallahassee are, are making it more difficult, as I think you're alluding to. Some of these bills are are saying, you know, we can't really talk that much about sex education in certain grades now and and things like that. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but but I th think that that's maybe what part of what you're alluding to. Absolutely. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. My guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. And we're talking about Florida's new law that's a ban on abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. It'll go into effect if the state Supreme Court agrees that the 15-week ban is constitutional because of Florida's privacy uh, clause, it's it's being questioned. But so we'll we'll know all that maybe in the next few weeks or months. But uh, we're talking right now about the six week ban and what it means for Floridians. One of the callers earlier was talking about, and and you, Amy, also were talking about while you were in Tallahassee that there's been a lot of activ activism around this issue. And I want to take a couple of minutes right now and play this story that comes to us from WSLR out of Sarasota. It's a right. low-power FM community radio station. And their reporter, Marianne Barasonic, was in Tallahassee last week, and she is reporting on a demonstration against this bill before it became law. So let's hear that report now, and we'll be back in just a few minutes with our guest, Amy Weintraub, you're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you from WMNF Tampa. Yesterday, Occupy Tally activists protested outside the Leon County Courthouse, while across the street, the Florida Senate passed a six week abortion ban. Maggie Moore was one of the protesters outside the courthouse. I'll tell you that pro life supporters got a permitted day one action on the steps full view and the rest of us weren't allowed except to come across the street like they can't hear us from here you know and i guess that's what they want they don't want to be able to hear the discontent that they're causing so they just keep pushing us further out and criminalizing our civil rights i find it appalling and i'm grateful that everyone's come this is a a huge shot in the arm to our local movement that got unceremoniously decimated by the police in 2020. Mass arrests, unnecessary violence against civilians. The debate on the bill took place with empty chambers after Occupy Tally protesters threw papers and stickers on the Senate floor. 
Lola was one of those protesters. She's 12 years old. I represent the youth that can't be here because they don't have supportive family and stuff. So it's important that you come and um, here to help us. Tell me what you did today in the Capitol. Um, today in the Capitol, we threw um, abortion and gender forming care stories down at the House floor uh, because they don't want to listen to the real stories. They will say all this stuff to make them more powerful, to get them votes. But they will never actually listen to a story of someone who's actually having a, had an abortion or someone who has gone through the hassle of trying to pick and choose an abortion in just a matter of time. So we sent those down so that, because we hold, we held them in the floor and tried to, um, and they wouldn't read them, they refused. So it's the only way that they'll actually read and listen to people because we're their constituents, they need to listen to us. So you tried handing them out and they wouldn't take them, so you just threw them down from the gallery? No, um, yesterday um, we, in the bridge, um, held them out up our own stories about abortion and um, gender affirming care and um, waited for them to look in the hallway and pass us while they were coming out and read them, but they refused and they just turned their head and looked down to the ground. Sarah Parker was also at the courthouse. She's with Women's Voices of Southwest Florida, a Sarasota-based organization. They're trying to call us insurrectionists for throwing down Plan C stickers and uh, affirming gender affirming care stories and abortion stories. Um, we were peaceful, we are peaceful, we'll continue to be peaceful. Um, we've been nothing but peaceful in the 10 years uh, I've been an activist and the two years all of us have been a team. Um, our group is gonna continue to grow as everyone's seeing. We're gonna continue to fight back against it. We are currently facing charges right now as Italia 11. We were arrested with Senator Book and Nikki Freed on Monday of last week. Um, we were demanding Tallahassee uh, mayor, who is a Democrat, to drop the charges. Um, we're fighting back. People keep saying Florida doesn't have any fight left, and we do. And we are fighting back. We are the fight, and we'll only get bigger. A 15-week ban was signed into law and then immediately challenged in the courts. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, the Florida Constitution has a privacy clause, which was specifically aimed at protecting abortion rights. In the past, the Florida Supreme Court upheld abortion rights, citing that privacy clause, but the current court is far more conservative. If the 15-week ban is struck down, then the six-week ban will go with it. Governor DeSantis signed the bill into law late last night. This is Marianne Barasonic reporting from Tallahassee for WSLR. Well, I want to thank our partners in WSLR for that report from Marianne Barasonic, who was in Tallahassee last week for a demonstration against this bill before it became law. She filed that story on Friday. And uh, we are talking now about that law. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. My guest is Amy Weintraub, Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. So, Amy, uh, I think that you weren't there for that particular protest, but you, you know, they also mentioned there when the a Democratic state senator and the chair of the Florida Democratic Party were arrested with and charged with trespassing during a protest in Tallahassee against the six week ban. And one of the people who was there in that story talked about how it's been difficult to get permits to to protest at the state capitol. That's been a big change, an administrative change this year, uh, where certain people can protest at the capitol if they have a sponsor from inside the state government. Uh, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to add related to that story? Yeah, um, I, I was there when a bunch of my friends were arrested. I didn't get arrested myself, but that was, um, you know, that was a really, really shocking um, event needless to say, but there is a level of a, a certain level of anxiety and fear about making our voices heard on state state property now. Um, DeSantis has done a really good job of of, of spreading fear um, so that people don't feel comfortable going into the Capitol and um, and showing dissent and people are feeling like they have to resort to these you know, more sort of um, activist act outs, if you will, um, to to make their voices heard. Because we do feel, we do feel that we're being ignored. We feel that our rational medical-based, scientific-based um, public health 
approaches are just being thrown to the wayside. And so it, it is a level, there is a lot of frustration about the legislature protecting themselves from us from our lived experience, from our truth, and from the, 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 the things that we know, um, our best, our best um, public health processes. So we're, um, there is frustration. I, I heard it very clearly in the, in the story that you just played, the activists who were on the ground and who don't feel that, don't feel, no longer feel comfortable going, um, going on to state property and, and like, like we didn't, you know, throughout all of history. All American history. So it's very, very frustrating. Well, let's hear from another caller before we end the show. Let's uh, get talk to Sarah in Tampa. Hi, Sarah. What would you like to add? Hi. Um, thanks so much for this uh, conversation. The first thing I want to say is women don't get pregnant on their own. The focus is always on women. Where are the men in this discussion taking responsibility for the abortions that have enabled them to move forward in their lives? Number one. And number two is that let's not be silly about this. If the Republicans, if Ron DeSantis' daughter gets gang raped when she's in college, you know she's going to get an abortion. We may not know about it. And the other suggestion that I have is that all of the women in this state who have health issues, I have stage four breast cancer, and I want to call Dr. DeSantis' office and say, should I transfer my care from Moffitt to you? And to Rick Scott and to Marco Rubio, are you now the, 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 the arbiters of what treatment I should get? And if you don't support whatever treatment Moffitt is giving me, you could take it to a court in Amarillo um, with a hand-picked judge and have the drug taken off the market. So um, I just think that this is a, a very important issue, and I'm really concerned that what the, a previous caller said I'm a retired nurse practitioner. There are a lot of people that are practicing medicine without a license, and there should be a law that makes it possible for those of us who are at their, you know, that they're affecting, sue them for practicing medicine without a license. That woman that was described as having an abortion at five months at home and hemorrhaging to death, her family should be able to sue DeSantis because he's, in, in effect, ordained as the um, Surgeon General of the state of Florida. And just in closing, I want to say that anybody who's thinking about voting for DeSantis for president or is concerned that he could be president, this is going to be, he's going to take this roadshow across the, uh, to the nation. So thank you so much for taking my call and I, I'll wait for your comment. Thank you. Sarah, thanks so much for your comments and good luck with your health situation. I hope you get great medical care. Uh, thank you for that call. And I also, before I turn it to Amy, I, I want to point out there have been men, and I would uh, say that you might consider them allies who've been writing and so forth during this show. I have been uh, putting them on hold, but uh, let me read one just for example. Bob in West Melbourne, Florida says, if men's, men were the ones getting pregnant, there would be abortion vending machines. So thank you for that comment all the way over on the East Coast of Florida. Amy, it, uh, in the last uh, few seconds that we have, is there anything that you'd like to respond to Sarah? Um, I totally agree with, that Sarah, with Sarah's point that reproductive health care impacts men too. Preg unintended pregnancy impacts men too, and it affects whole families, it affects whole communities, and people must be able to access the care that they need without shame and stigma. And that, you know, and and the economic reality is that people need to make their own, their their decisions about what's best for their families and men men certainly are part of those families and i am seeing a, a big increase in the number of males who are attending rallies and other events that we're having and we have a great group here in florida called men for choice so i'm really grateful for the males who are our allies in this we need you we need you to vote correctly we need you to get involved well thank you so much for coming on tuesday cafe today amy Thank you so much, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Amy Weintraub is Reproductive Rights Program Director at Progress Florida. She's also a member of WMNF's Community Advisory Board and Programming Committee. You can watch this interview beginning this afternoon on WMNF.org. Tuesday Cafe will also air soon on the television station TBAE. 
I want to thank our phone screener and lighting engineer, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10 during this time slot tomorrow. Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. There are new Florida laws that make it more difficult or expensive for people to sue for money damages. And next up on Wavemakers, Janet and Tom will talk with some, with some local brewers about the future of craft brewing. You're listening to WMNF Tampa.